Okay, hi. I'm Anna, and I am the knitter behind the Bluebird Box Knitwear Designs. might look like I'm wearing earrings. I have some knockoff air buds in and I'm gonna try and see if that helps with some of the sound issues that I've been having. I just, I know I'm a quiet talker and without a microphone it can be hard to hear me so I'm gonna try and speak up and I'm gonna see if the, they might not even be connected. I, I tried my best. I might just be wearing them as ear jewelry right now. Okay, so first I just wanted to say thank you for being here and welcome. Um, I am probably more nervous for this episode than I was for the last one, which I kind of thought it would be the opposite, but um, that episode really took off and I don't know why. Like, I'm not a technology person. I don't know algorithms at all, um, but somehow I hit some sort of YouTube algorithm. So uh, at least that's how I, what I can tell from what people have told me about how they found the podcast and like the analytics of YouTube says that that's how people found me. So good on me for doing that. Uh, not sure how that worked, but um, yeah. So it was beyond what I expected. And um, I honestly don't know if I would have published that one. Maybe I would have spent more time editing um, if I'd known that so many people would watch it. But uh, yeah, I feel really blessed that people seem to have enjoyed it. So um, welcome back. And I, yeah, at first when it was just starting to, when I was about a th maybe a thousand views, I thought, oh, this is great now. And I started to think about what I wanted to say for my next one. And then it just kept climbing up and up the views and the subscriptions and everyone's sweet comments. And then I uh, started to think, well, they don't, they don't even know me. Like if they, if they knew me, they wouldn't like me. And I just thought I would share that because I think that's a really universal human fear that we would if, if people saw us for who we really were, we would not be accepted. So I just wanted to share that vulnerability with you. Um, it also reminded me of a quote. Um, it goes, to be not known and loved is superficial. To be known and not loved is our greatest fear. Um, um, that, that just popped in my mind when I was thinking about what I wanted to say. And so my hope is that on this channel, you would feel welcomed and accepted. Um, and yeah, that I would be able to show my true self, not just the, um, I don't know. Yeah, that I would be able to be courageous enough to be vulnerable and show some of my flaws and foibles. Okay. Um, yes, and also I wanted to say thank you very, 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 very much for your sweet comments. Um, I was like determined to answer everybody's comment on my first YouTube episode. Uh, and I was quite almost judgmental of podcasters that say, oh, I tried to answer all of the comments, but I just couldn't. And I, I was like, well, come on, like how hard is it really to add? You just write to write two words, thank you. But I have since eaten those words because it's not so much difficult, it's just that you you bore yourself because you can't think of very many original creative ways to say how much you appreciate these beautiful thoughts that people are sending you. So I got to about 80, I think, and then I, I just lost interest because of my own um, lack of creativity in answering comments. I wanted to really, I really wanted to. So if, um, I try, I, I did like everyone's comment, like gave it a little heart. So if, if I gave it a little heart, then I read it 
and I really was very touched and I just loved hearing where you're all from and how you found the podcast and what you found interesting. So yes, my deepest thanks. And I'm sorry that I failed to answer every comment. I get like five comments on my Instagram post. So I just, I just thought too highly of myself. What's, what's another 200 to answer really? So let's get into the knitting. I'll start off with um, some of the smaller things that I've knitted. Uh, I don't really have a lot of designs to share this time. I have things that I'm writing and that are in testing, so uh, there's not really much new to share. But um, I have knit a lot in December. Since my last podcast, basically, I stopped knitting any work stuff. I just like went crazy for fun. So yeah, I have some things to share. So. First off, um, my two oldest, they're boys. My girls are here. School was canceled this week and um, my husband took my older two to go buy skates. And the younger two are supposed to be watching Cinderella, but they don't seem to stay interested in TV very long. The boys could watch TV their entire lives but the girls seem to last half an hour and then they come looking for me. So we'll see how quickly I can get through this. Okay, so um, my oldest two have, they're nine and 11 boys. They have, they took up knitting for a short period of time over the fall. And my, um, my second, my nine-year-old started something from this book. This is the Knit a Square book. Um, my mom bought this for my oldest a few years ago. Basically, it's a whole bunch of patterns where you be, you knit like a you knit a square of fabric plus some extra pieces and you seam it together, stuff it, and you end up with a toy. So um, he started the shark, which is this one. So you knit all these pieces. You knit this square and you knit some different smaller pieces and then you have to seam it. So this is like, honestly, my least favorite kind of knitting. I hate the fiddly little stuff. I hate seaming. Um, that stuff just like completely unmotivates me. So I should have really thought twice about giving it as a first project to my kid. But anywho, that's what I did. So he started and then lost interest. Who could blame him? But, and then he just kept asking me, mom, can you finish it? Mom, can you finish? Yeah. Um, so he started it and then kept asking me to finish it, finish it, finish it. And I was like, no, I do not knit for anybody else anymore. I will teach you to knit, I will not finish it. And then I just buckled and I finished it for his Christmas present and he was so thrilled, he was so excited. It was absolutely worth it. Um, so this isn't the little shark. So I cast on half the number of stitches that it called for just because I couldn't, I didn't have the time to make like a giant one. And then you seam up these little bits. <laughs> oh, he's kind of silly and my seaming is not great, but He's kind of cute. So that's Sheldon the shark from this. Knit a square. Create a cuddly creature by Nikki Epstein. There you go. Last time I was talking about um, the Miles hat and mittens, which I released in January, in December. Thank you very much for all the purchases that I got over December and I'm still selling that pattern. Thank you so much. So glad you liked it. Um, so the hat, the hat and the mittens. And then I was talking about how Brittany from Crux Fibers suggested I make the cowl and she finished a sample and I didn't, but I did finish eventually. So here it is 
was a scrappy project. I used the remains of my mohair and my worsted and some DK that I had in my stash. And um, yeah, made a cat. The one in the pattern is actually shorter, like it's designed shorter, but you can make it as big as you have yarn for it. And yeah, that's that. Not much to say about that. It's just a tube. Oh. Uh, I also wanted to show you some mittens that I'm making for my mom. It's super cold here. We're in the middle of a two week Arctic frigid to cold snap. Um, it was minus 30 all last week over Christmas break. Um, yesterday it warmed up for about 12 hours. It got to minus 14. We went to the ski hill and spent the day outside. And then this week, today it's minus 25 and just blowing like crazy, snowing like crazy. And that is just so frigid out there. And it's supposed to be frigid all week. So my mom's doesn't have warm enough mittens. So I'm trying to make her some liners for inside her like ski mittens. That's what I do. I wear my wool ones inside my ski mittens and then I'm toasty warm. So I just used some custom woolen mills single ply and these are not blocked but once they're blocked they like make a really nice thick well not thick but like um uniform fabric with where there's like not a lot of holes and stuff and the wool is really warm so i wanted to show you i was too lazy to pick a to change my cable to uh the right size one for magic loop instead i used this one which like when you when you are knitting like this you can see that this that's not good you shouldn't have that kind of um, stretch there your cable should be like long enough that it can really pinch together and then you don't get this weirdness that i'll show you so here you can see my beginning around oh <clears throat> sorry here my beginning of round see there's a huge gap there so here you can see this is where I start had my beginning round or where I like I guess it's not my beginning round is it no I think it's the the opposite side it doesn't matter but it was where the join was and then I switched the join and moved it to here but then here this is where I turned my work inside out so I was still working the right side you're actually, instead of working this way, you turn it inside out. And you still knit the same direction. Like you're still knitting this way, but the outside of your work is sort of facing you. I'm not explaining this well, but I just wanted to show you that when you turn your small circumference magic loop knitting inside out, you can really minimize that join spot. This won't matter because once you, once I wash this, like this stuff is magic and it just like fixes, it's so forgiving, fixes all your mistakes and all your little weird stuff. That's a great thing about wool. Um, it's not like um, other fibers that especially unnatural fibers that your mistake will just stay if you kinked something or something's wonky, it just stays, but wool like fixes it for you. So anyway, I just wanted to show you that this, this is where that join was and this is where I turned it inside out. So if you're finding that you have a lot of laddering and like gappiness in your magic loop for mittens or socks or anything like that, try, try turning them inside out, giving that a go. So those, yeah, that's not a pattern. I'm just winging that. I just did a little bit of ribbing. And because I don't love knitting ribbing, I just did that to stop that from rolling in, out, in, and then stocking it, thumb gusset, and going straight. 
and I also messed up the thumb gussets. They're not the same, but who cares? Okay. So it is, and then um, one thing about me is that I do not knit socks. I have knit socks. I don't like it, so I've just sort of given up on that. Maybe one day, I think I would like it better if I just did a tube and did an afterthought heel, because then you don't have to like stop and think about what to do. And I always find my socks don't fit exactly how I hoped they would. And then it's like all that time wasted. You have to do two of the same thing, which I don't enjoy doing. Um, anyhow, but I do knit socks that have a lot of function in my life. Um, these are some trampoline socks that I made for my kids because it gets cold here often before it snows they enjoy or they they clear off the trampoline we leave our trampoline out all year so sometimes they like to clear off the snow and then they go jump on it but they, they're not allowed to use their boots and then just regular socks are obviously not warm enough so I made these really thick um, socks out of this is custom woolen mills two ply and I stranded it so it's double like a color stranded it yes yes can you help Rosie please can you help Rosie please um, yeah so it's really it's quite thick so I made these, I made it up, those, and then um, Amber from A Lovely Yarn podcast makes these slippers that are really cool. They, you start out flat, you work a section of garter flat, and then you join to work in the round for the toe part. So um, I thought, hey, that would be a really non-fiddly way to make more trampoline socks so yeah I don't know the pattern name she said it was free I never looked it up I just figured I could do it by what I saw so I just cast on I think I cast on 60 stitches with like a, maybe a five millimeter needle and this is works like this is a seam here so this is actually about a big rectangle like that. And then you work it back and forth. And then you, um, I, cat, I bound off these stitches, worked these. What did I do? Yeah, then I worked up again and then bound off and then worked around, joined to work in the round. And I also stranded the toe so that it would be warmer than it would be otherwise and I didn't have enough yarn to do matching so I did the opposite and then at the end you seam I seamed this also I had hoped to keep it open like a boot liner liner but uh, it just wouldn't have stayed on their feet so yeah tell me do you use trampoline socks or trampoline slippers for your kids last accessory I think yes last one I decided last minute like basically the day it started that I was going to do the cozy up shawl mcal and I looked through my stash and I found some yarn that my aunt had passed on to me she made this amazing knee-high sock out of this yarn and then gave up on it and gave it to me so I'm gonna rip out this all oh, this work look at that oh what a shame but I'm not knitting socks so it's getting ripped out so this is gonna be my main color this is um, Cascade Heritage Silk it's 85% superwash merino and 15% silk 437 yards per hundred grams so I decided to do that for my main color and then I have to pick three other contrast colors 
which I haven't decided yet. I have some options. So this is um, Kaylee, the, this is Kaylee the Ludite yarn. Um, and it's a single ply, I think. It's called, the color is Tusky Red. It has 450 yards for 100 grams. Yeah, it's single ply. 90% um, Dorset and Suffolk, crossed with Suffolk. From Bluffton, Alberta. 10% Black Welsh Mountain, crossed with Dusset. From Innisfail, Alberta. And it's dyed with Matter Root. And it was clipped in 2020. It's so pretty. So that's that one. Oh, and this one is um, also Kaylee the Ludite. This is my Finn fingering from my Legacy Pullover. The leftovers from my contrast colors from that. So those are pretty. Um, and then I have my, this one's dyed with avocado. And this one is the, my other contrast color from my Legacy Pullover. This is I'm dyed with um, marigold. Those are so pretty together. So uh, I had some options. And then this is, <laughs> do you really want to know all these? I don't know. This is Holzgar and Coast. I don't know the color. From my Sora top. Um, yeah, let's do this. That's pretty. Oh, the rest of my family's home now. Or, yeah, any combination of these. I, I really like this. This is uh, Brian Dye Works from her advent. Mystery advent. Um, she did some, like, little groupings over December. And it's called Mason. And it's a super wash, too, with nylon in it. Here's my other one. Oh, this one. Or we could go like browns. Some other colors from Brian Dye Works. Anywho, I will just decide as I go along. So I will show you the mystery shawl as far as I've got. So if you're working on this and don't want to see it, um, just look away. And I will tell you, I'll just give you a little flash so you don't have to look away for very long. Oh, that's the wrong side. Here's the right side. Yeah, it's kind of fun. I'm struggling with it a little bit because I like to work from charts and there's no chart. So I just find I it really slows me down if I don't have a chart. But other than that, I'm really loving this beautiful lace. Look, it's so pretty. And can you hear the thundering feet? <laughs> I don't know. I think I have to go now. I'll try and finish later. Hi, I'm back. Sorry if the camera shifted. Um, same day, five minutes later. See if this goes okay. So that was the last of my accessories. I'll talk about my sweaters. So I'll start off with this one. This is Celeste by Sari Norland in um, Brian Dye Works Brulee, her um, Highland Worsted. It's really really beautiful yeah one of my favorite sweaters oh. yeah i did pretty much to pattern i added some short rows um along this back here just it helps like sort of tuck it in lengthens the back and kind of like tucks it in towards my body more yeah, um, I really love a sweater. I finished it uh, this early this year. Um, okay, and I also finished another sweater since 
my last podcast, I decided to, um, I had a cone of, it's actually here, it's what I was, I'm using for my mittens, this cone of Custom Woolen Mills One Ply. Um, it's color two, it's like a sheep, a sheep shade of theirs. And it has all, it's like not just one color, it has lots of black and gray and white. Um, so I had that cone in my stash and I had nothing to knit and so I just thought I would cast on a sweater and see how far I got. So I got it done in like three weeks and it's really nice and warm. So this is a sweater that I have no plans of publishing. Sorry that I'm showing that to you, but I might use like things I've learned from construction of it and the design and what I liked about it, what I didn't like for uh, future designs. You never know. Um, yeah, it's a lot, a lot of work, a lot of unpaid time, a lot of hours and hours and hours. And yeah, there's just so much to do for a publishing pattern. It's much easier just to um, knit something for myself. So that's what I wanted. I wanted like super easy, something just for the joy of it over Christmas. And this is know if you can see much. I made the arms too short. I do that every time. I don't know what my deal is. If it like shrinks up when I wash it, I think it might. Um, but I think it was short before I washed it too. Um, yeah, I do that like, I think I, even for this one, I added some length and I just, I, I always cut when I need to add length to sleeves I always cut so um, and I'll explain why um, if I have a sleeve done and it's to the cuff and I like the the width at the cuff it means if I cut this ribbing or if I rip back the ribbing sorry rip back the ribbing and continue knitting then my cuff width is actually up my forearm so it would be tight here if it fits me here and then I'm adding more length it would actually be the, the cuff circumference would sit here instead because I've already done all those decreases and I am the laziest knitter in the world I do not like to do redo work if I can help it um, and so I've learn some ways to get around ripping back. I am much better about ripping back now. If I don't like something, I know I need to rip it back because I, it's not worth all the hours I spent if I'm not gonna wear it. And I won't wear it if I'm not happy with it. So I have gotten better, but if there's a way I can avoid ripping back, I will do that. So I think I might keep these sleeves this length. They sit right, right about here, which is okay. And I'll just push them up and it'll be fine. Um, but if I was going to make them longer, I would actually cut it right about the where the width is that I want my forearm. So right about here, that width, wherever that is on here, I would cut that right across. I would pick up the stitches around, leaving this part to the side, I'm keeping that for later, and I would knit straight for the length that I wanted to add and then I would graft on the piece that I cut off and that way I don't have to redo ribbing I don't like knitting ribbing so I will avoid it if I can so that means I don't have to rip it out and redo it and I'm just basically just adding stockinette straight where I want more length um, yeah I've done that for lots and lots of sweaters and it has made knitting sweater is much more enjoyable for me. So I think I won't cut this one though. So it's quite oversized. It's a raglan, but I did, I did increasing sleeves and body side of the raglan right here on both sides for this, this much. And then I did only the sleeve side. That's why it looks like a little zigzag there. And then I went back to both 
to the um, yolk and then I actually picked up only part of the sleeve leaving this extra for the body and then that allows this stitch pattern to go down to the body down to the ribbing so this is just a eyelet lace with a twisted rib and then there's a garter um, section a garter I think it's only one stitch yeah it's just one stitch going knit and purl in the middle so pretty simple design I started out knitting flat like a cast on um, if anybody's has the Top Down Sweaters book by Ann Budd, she always, all of her designs or the way she, it's kind of a do-it-yourself sweater book. Um, and she, you cast on flat and you increase like this, like back and forth and add, you add stitches to the front of your neckline and then you increase you're, as you're increasing the raglan you're actually increasing the neckline also so that means that you have more rows up here than down here so that you it's like sort of like short rows but it actually short rows because you start with a, a certain number of stitches when you do short rows your neck can't stretch as much like your a neckline here this is um this one doesn't have short rows at the neckline, but imagine this is, if it was short rows, you can kind of like push this back up, but this can't drop as much as if you do it back and forth, you can actually add a lot of length and you can get quite a big neckline. So it, I prefer it. Um, I know some people have a hard time wrapping their brains around working flat and then joining, but I think the... The result is just so much more it's so much more like a store-bought sweater in the end yeah that's so that's the final neckline shape there so, yeah it's super nice this is in custom yeah i said custom wool and mills so it's like 100 percent wool and it's wool and spun and it's like so squishy it's i think it's a 22 stitch gauge I didn't really check gauge <laughs> that's how slack I was about this sweater but it's like oh it's so nice you guys um, here I'll show you I'll show you the difference between here's a little end that I forgot to weave in and I will show you compared to what it's like before you block it so there's the one that's not washed and here's the one that's washed. Can you see? It's like three times as wide. It doesn't change your gauge, but it just like, see how poofy that is? It just fills every little hole and every little space that you left behind just gets swallowed up by that poof. So that's why I love wool. One of the reasons. And it's also super cozy and warm. Um, finally, every, there's a lot of people who often when I show this sweater, people get excited about it. Um, it is a self-drafted pattern. It's the one I was wearing during the last episode and I didn't say anything about it. <laughs> Sorry, I meant to, but, um, it, yeah, people really enjoy this one. However, um, there's some tricky bits about it. So this is the one, this is the stitch pattern that's in it. So um, this year I released the Lennox cardigan for, for kids. Um, it's a really, it's kind of oversized and short and, and three quarter length sleeves. It's really cute over dresses. Um, my girls don't wear it because they don't really like to wear knitting. Well, my, my youngest does, but this one I made for my oldest daughter. Um, yeah, I was really proud of how this neckline turned out. 
This stitch pattern um, was one that I got inspired by a friend of mine, Bethany, from Birds and Butterflies on Instagram. She also sells, dyes and sells yarn. She um, posted a picture of herself wearing a store-bought sweater and I was like, oh wow, that's such a beautiful stitch pattern. So I asked her to send me some pictures of her sweater and she did. And I was like, hey, I think I could figure out what that is. And it's actually like the bubble stitch in reverse. Um, if anybody's done any of Stephen West's bubble patterns, I think they're all the same stitch. I'm not sure about that. But I know his shawl, his, a couple of his shawls are this kind of stitch where um, you actually knit into rows below and it pulls your... Um, work up and bubbles it. It doesn't really bubble as much on this. You can't really see, but that's the bubble side. And then on the other side, it makes this like lattice. So that was a cardigan knit flat. So easy peasy, <laughs> sort of, I don't know. I don't know if some people find it easy or not, but anyway, I like that one. And then I thought, oh, I could make a pullover for me. I don't really wear cardigans a lot. That might be just because I don't own a lot. But um, yeah, I thought, oh, I'll make a, a pullover for me. And you know what? If you do it in the round, then you only ever do the right side rows, which are, or the wrong side. Sorry, if you do it in the round, you could work it inside out and only ever have the stockinette side, the knit side facing you. And that would be super, super enjoyable. So basically I knit this one from the inside out and then turned it, turned it right side out when I was done. However, because I don't love short rows, no, that's not true. You would still be working flat if you had short rows. You're working the stitch pattern in the round then when you get to the neckline, you have to turn it into flat knitting. So that makes the design a little bit more complicated. On top of that, um, you have to decrease and then that kind of messes with where you're knitting below. So people have to like be aware of when to start a new knit below, even though it might not be very obvious. Like look here, this is like, you just knit one and then you right away knit below. And that, but that wasn't something you were doing on previous rows, it's bottom up. Um, so there's that too, that makes it complicated. And then also it's bottom up because of the, it's actually easier to do, keep track of where you are in the pattern when you're decreasing, then increasing, increase, you have to add stitches and then you're not sure like, do I knit below now or later or where am I? And then you'd end up with like a big, you might end up with a big ridge of like reverse stocking at here of just dead space. So there's just, yeah. So then if it's bottom up, so what I'm saying is if it's bottom up, then my testers have to finish the entire sweater which means that my testing period has to be longer. It's in a sport weight at a 22 stitch gauge. So it's an oversized sweater at a, with a lot of yarn, small needles. You have to finish the entire thing. So it's like, ugh, I don't know. Every time I do a test knit, it's just, test knitters are amazing people. They are so awesome. But running a test knit, can be a challenge just because you're not in control of your timeline. So um, if people can't finish in time, if you have people drop out, then you have to sign up new people, then it can take like months past what you expected and then it shifts your entire, entire design schedule for your year. So yeah, that's the problem with that. It's not the math, it's just trying to explain to people how to do things. That's what I really struggle with as a designer. Um, I can do the math, I can figure out how 
how to do things. Um, I can figure out what techniques to use, but trying to explain those little fiddly details, I am not the best at. And so sometimes you just have to know where to put your energy. And if it's a lot of unpaid hours, it's not worth it to me at the moment. But this is a sweater that I love and I would like to publish one day. Um, and it's just the writing up that's the problem. So that is the um, unpublished sweater that I was wearing last time. I also wanted to show you, <laughs> I usually find that <clears throat> my cuffs stretch out. They seem to be like the right size when I knit them and finish them. Maybe even after I block them, but then as I wear it, it just kind of bleh, stretches out into nothing. So, <clears throat> and then I really don't like floppy sleeves. I, I have four kids. I am doing stuff all the time. If my sleeves are getting caught and stuff, I have no patience for that. So all I do <laughs> is I just like tack my sleeve down. I don't know if you can see that. I just folded it in basically like like this oh gosh like that and I just sewed it that's it it made like a little pleat and I made sure it was on the armpit side and yeah it's much more wearable and I don't have to redo ribbing <laughs> gonna put some podcast rec recommendations I have them on my phone I have a list of them on my phone so I will just type them up and everything I I want to link to I won't say that I will link to everything because I am a human <laughs> but it will be in this there's like a little V like this in your corner like here and if you just click that it looks like a little V it will drop down um, and show you like I I put a lot of text into my description box and um, I will try to put links or at least the words that you need to put into Google to find things. Um, I think that's why my video went into the alg YouTube algorithm because I put a lot of words in there. So if you're looking for something like, like in my last video, I said that I, that the sweater, I said about the sweater I was wearing that it was an un unpublished self-drafted design. So if you're wondering about, yeah, anything I talk about, or if you want to find the websites for the yarns and stuff like that, I'll try and put that in there. Um, yes, so I will put podcast recommendations in a list, and then I will put, um, I'll try and put the right words so that you can look it up on YouTube. Okay, um, this has been a lot of time. If you want to hear, some people wanted to hear about my, how I learned to knit and um, so I'll just tell it quick. Uh, when I was eight years old, an adopted grandma, like a, an older lady who acted as my grandma in Africa of all places. So we were far away from our own family and she was, um, giving us some grandma time and she taught me to knit and I think she taught me the purl stitch but I'm not sure um, I don't remember ever finishing anything when I was a kid but somehow I still knew the knit and purl stitch as a in my late teens so when I was 18 I was um, a student in Camrose Alberta living away from home and a friend said that she wanted to learn to knit things, not to learn to knit a scarf, not to learn to knit a dishcloth, I wanted to learn to knit items. And I was like, hey, I really want to learn to knit stuff. So another friend of ours, um, happened to be a guy, but he had adopted an adopted grandma in Camrose who uh, had like a knit group or something she was part of, I'm not sure. A um, bunch of ladies met at her house. So she kindly invited us along. She um, taught us to knit mittens and this was in 2001 so I I don't even think that there were like circular needles like maybe there was I didn't know about them so everything was like flat needles or double pointed so we knit these mittens flat actually with like straight needles 
Um, and she said, if we can knit and we can purl, we can do everything. We can learn to do everything that you need to do to make a mitten. Like you can learn to de increase, you can learn to decrease, you can learn to put stitches in a hold, you can learn to seam. So that's what we did. I'm gonna grab the mitt. Um, so this is not my first mitten, but this is one of the many hundreds of flat mittens that I <laughs> knitted because after that I was just like hooked. Because once you do something and you make something that you're proud of, man, you cannot be stopped. So forget the dishcloths, do mittens, love it, put in some stripes. <laughs> this is the, the mitten. So it's kind of hard to imagine, but um, this is the seam here along the back. And also there's a seam here along the thumb. So actually it was like this. This is how you, no, no, hold on. It's like, oh gosh, okay, that's not helpful. Okay, so you knit it flat with the thumb in the middle and then you put those thumb stitches on hold and then on the next round, you cast on across that hole and then you work back and forth, keep going. And then you do decreases. You're doing decreases flat. Like it just goes like this, kind of like curls in a bit. And then at the end, you seam up the side, right, right along here. All this was open and this thumb was open. Yeah, that was, that was it, rainbow stripes. So we learned to like weave in our ends and everything. So after that, I yeah, knit mittens for everybody I knew and I was totally hooked on knitting. And since then I haven't stopped. That was like, 2001 was like my start of my obsessive knitting journey. Can you relate to that? When was the time that you were like, couldn't it be stopped? Okay, it's really beautiful outside. It's really snowing, but um, not very pleasant. And I hope that you get to be outside wherever you are, and I really appreciate you being here. Thank you again. Um, yeah, I hope that you have a wonderful start to 2022, and take care.